into the book of Ruth, and um, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, there are only two books in the entire Bible that have the names of women, and Ruth is one of them. Does anybody have a clue what the other is? Esther, of course. Does anybody know what the name Ruth means? Good. I get to be the first to tell you. That's awesome. Uh, Ruth means friendship or one who is a friend or a friend, a compassionate friend. And we have a Ruth in our class today. And Ruth, we're not preaching and teaching about you. It's the one in the Bible, okay? So if anything I say, it's not about you, okay? But I don't think anything we say today will be about you, of course. But uh, it's amazing that Ruth was a Jewish woman, and she, or a, a Gentile woman, pardon me, and she, of course, ended up marrying a Jewish man, Boaz. And then Esther uh, actually uh, was a Jewish woman, and she ended up marrying a Gentile king. So the two opposites there from the book of uh, Esther and Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is about the subject of redemption. And that's the primary purpose of, this, of the book of Ruth is redemption. And Boaz, of course, became her kinsman redeemer. And uh, redemption is the theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about redemption and God redeeming lost mankind. And uh, even when we get to heaven, we're going to sing the redemption song. Uh, thou was, uh, uh, we're going to say, thou art worthy. Uh, you, you were slain. The lamb was slain. And you redeemed us by your blood. So redemption is an act of God. Only He can redeem. We can't redeem ourselves. He has to be the one who redeems us. Uh, we have to come to Him in faith, in repentance. And then He does the work of grace in our heart and life through salvation as we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can redeem. Uh, only God uh, could give His only begotten Son on the cross of Calvary to redeem us because redemption had to be by a kinsman redeemer. So God had to become man in order to redeem us back to himself. And this is the story here. And it's written from the perspective of a love story. It's a romance. Ruth and Boaz fall in love with one another. And he being uh, the male lover, uh, loving the female lover both ways... They join together, and he redeems her from her poverty, her slavery, and everything that we're going to talk about in the future. So it's very important to see the background of this book. Now today we'll probably just be giving you most of the background and an introduction to our study. Uh, this little book is the eighth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. And then after it comes 1st and 2nd Samuel. So it's sandwiched in between Judges and 1st and 2nd Samuel. Now, Ruth is the 8th book of the Bible. Now remember, if you've ever studied Scripture numerics, 8 in your Bible is the number of a new beginning. Uh, it's important. Have we ever studied numbers in this Bible study class? Does anybody remember? I know I taught them here one time years ago. Mary, I think you were in that class, and I appreciate your being here today. I haven't seen this lady in quite a while, and I appreciate her coming this morning. But this is the eighth book of the Bible, and as such, in line with the meaning of the number eight, it starts a new beginning for Ruth in her life as she is going to come from the place where she and her family went in Moab, and she's going to come back to Bethlehem in the time of barley harvest, and we'll, we'll be talking about all that great stuff. Now, uh, according to Jewish tradition, Samuel is the author of this book. He wrote the book of Ruth. He wrote the books of First and Second Samuel. Now, you remember the story of Samuel as a little boy. Uh, his, he, well, let's go back to Hannah, his mother, before she had Samuel. She was barren. She had no children. And one of the worst things that a Hebrew woman could ever do would be not have any children. It was the desire of every Hebrew woman who ever lived after Genesis uh, to bear the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so because she was barren, it was like a curse placed upon those women. 
and she had no child. And you remember reading about her going to the temple and she was so fervent in prayer and so upset because she didn't have any children. And she begged the Lord for a child and she was so worked up in her prayer time that the priest Eli thought that she had been drinking a little bit too much and she was a little tipsy and, and he, the Bible said he marked her mouth. Now uh, that may be a pretty uh, bad thing to do for a preacher to uh, tell, you know, mark her mouth, he being the priest. I mean, what if your pastor came and you're praying, you know, and he, he said, slaps you a little bit on, hey, be quiet, you're getting too rowdy in the church or something like that. But he marked her mouth and she said, hey, I've not been drinking anything. She said, I'm just a woman that has a, a, a heart for God and a burden to have a child. And what did God do? He heard her prayer and he gave her a child and she said to the Lord, if you give me a little male child, a boy, baby, I'll give him back to you. And when he was just a young child, she took him to the temple. Or actually, there was no temple then. It was at Shiloh where they had set up an altar and a place of worship and so on. But she took him there and he lived there with Eli until he became grown and he himself became a prophet of God. One of the better ones, of course, that you read about in the Old Testament. And uh, Jewish history bears out the fact that he wrote this little book, the book of Ruth. Now let's look at the time element. The Bible said in verse 1 of chapter Ruth that it was in the days when the judges ruled. Now the book of Judges comes first before Ruth. So it was in the days when the judges ruled. Now there were 12 judges. Uh, you've studied enough of the Old Testament to know that Joshua was the leader that God used to bring the children of Israel into the promised land and possess their possessions. God had given them this land through the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And after spending 430 years in Egyptian bondage, they were delivered by Moses, as you well know, on the night of Passover, the first Passover in Exodus chapter 12. And then because of their unbelief, they did not go into the promised land when they could have. And they didn't believe God after the spies came back, gave this great report. But 10 of those spies said, hey, the place is full of, uh, uh, you know, giants over here. We can't conquer this. We can't do that. We can't do that. And how many remember the names of those 10 spies? Anybody remember any of their names whatsoever? No, the 10 now. The 10 spies that gave the evil report. Do you remember any of their names? No, but there's two names you remember. The two who gave the good report. What are they? Caleb and Joshua. You don't remember the others. You know why? The Bible said the name of the wicked shall rot. There will be no remembrance of those who do evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, you can take wicked people who live in your community. When they're gone, people are sort of glad they're not around. I mean, to be honest about it, if they've done wickedly and evil uh, uh, in the community, but you take somebody who lives for God and they maintain a great testimony for the Lord and they live for years and I mean, they just grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus and when they die, they're never forgotten. You remember them, I mean, on and on and on because the memory of that person lives on and on and on and I, that's the way it was with Caleb and Joshua. But because of the evil report, the whole group of people, and there could have been as many as three million of these people, some theologians declare to us. And so they wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years. I mean, just back and forth and all over that wilderness till the old ones died out and the new ones came along. So they didn't possess their possessions when they could have. And then God raised up Joshua, of course, the leader, to take them into the promised land. And he did that. After they got into the land, they needed a government set up of some sort. Because uh, uh, anytime you've got a number of people, you need some type of government. So they decided to set up a system of judges. And over a period of about 350 years, there were 12 of these judges. Now, do you remember any of the judges' names? Can you think of any that would be um, somebody you remember right now? I, I'm sorry? Samson. Samson. We remember Samson. And there's another one we remember pretty well. His name was Gideon. 
The other names, we don't know, well, we don't know a lot about them. Now, according to what I have studied in Jewish history on this book, th these events that occurred in the book of Ruth were actually carried out during the, one of the judges' uh, judgeship, and his name was Jair, J-A-I-E-R, Jair. And that's about the time that all this transpired. The Bible said it was in the days of the judges and when they ruled. Now the judges, the, the years of the judges, the 350 years or so of the judges was a dark time period in, uh, among the people of God. Here's what would happen. Now God had told them, don't you intermarry with the heathen. Don't you worship any other gods except me because all these heathen nations around them had their own gods. Moab is where this little place that they went to, the country of Moab, they had their own God as well as Israel. Israel's one uh, true and living God was Yahweh or Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's the true and living God. That's the God we serve as well. But here's the situation. Uh, they they inter, begin to intermarry with heathen peoples. They begin to accept their gods, their way of life. It even got so bad in the days of Solomon, if you want to study a little farther into the Old Testament, he actually set up groves where these idol gods could be worshipped. He even built sanctuaries to some of these gods. The reason being that he married women from all these other countries. Uh, now, he, he's supposed to be the smartest man in the Bible in his time, but a man who would have a thousand wives, I, 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 I didn't say anything about that. You all didn't hear me mention that at all. But uh, I, I doubt if he was that smart in certain areas of his life. But many of those marriages were women he never even had anything to do with whatsoever. It was for political reasons to enlarge his territory and his empire. And during the reign of Solomon, Israel was at the peak of their their prosperity, their, their greatness, and so on and so forth. So these people, instead of obeying God, they started intermingling and intermarrying with people who worshiped idol gods, and they brought all this into this time frame of the judges, and here's what would happen. Uh, they would go into apostasy, and then they would realize they had done wrong, and then God would, would forgive them. They would repent, and then he would give them a judge that would try to get them straightened out, like Samson, Gideon, and some of these others. Uh, they would go into times of famine and poverty, and then they would be pulled out of it for a while. And this happened over and over and over uh, for a period of about 350 years. And this is what was going on when, when the events of Ruth was taking place. It was in the days when the judges ruled. And then the second thing you'll notice here, there was a famine in the land. Now, uh, famine, and I was looking, I was, when, when I was doing my studying, and I've not taught Ruth since the year 1990. I went back in my notes. I have, for 46 years, I've got messages that I've preached. I've got filing cabinets full of all this stuff. When I'm gone, somebody's going to have a heyday going through all that stuff. I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to let them worry about it. How about you? Uh, that's the way I'm going to do it. But I've told young preachers I will give them my stuff. Uh, I, I told Thomas the other day I've, I've been going through my books and stuff, and I've been finding duplicates. And I told him, I said, if you want some of my books, I'll give them to you. I'd like to see uh, them in circulation and being used by a younger preacher. And... Um, uh, in fact, uh, recently I have a young preacher in my church that helps me a lot as far as taking care of the Wednesday night services and stuff. And he told me how much he loved Charles Spurgeon and his writings. I had a 15-volume set of Charles Spurgeon's messages from the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England in the 1800s, valued at $3,500. Many of the books had never been opened because how much can you do, you know, in a lifetime? And they were bought for me as a Christmas present the year after I got married. My father-in-law and mother-in-law bought those for me and gave them to me as a Christmas present. So he told me how much he loved Spurgeon. So one day I loaded up those 15 volumes. I cleaned them off, dusted them off a little bit where they'd been in the bookcase. 
And I put them in my car and I gave them to him. I said, here, you can have these. Jeannie said to me when I was telling her I was going to give those books to this young man, she said, Larry, do you know what those books are worth? I said, I have no clue. I don't know what they gave for them. You know, it's been 45 years ago. I've had them for 45 years. And she said, well, said I looked them up online and they're valued at $3,500. I said, well, I've already promised him I was going to give them to him. If I hadn't have said I was going to give them to him, I would have taken them back. But I'm a man of my word. I can't just do that. You know what I'm saying? But I hope he's not hearing this. He may be listening later on. That would be awful. Yeah, you know we are being taped. We are online right now. By the way, uh, many people are watching this. I've ran into four or five people lately that say they watch the Tuesday morning Bible study class we have here. And I'm grateful to hear that. That's good. Uh, so uh, anyway, let's get back to it here. I was studying and looking at all these different... There's been many times of famine in the Old Testament. Uh, and I'm not going to go through those for the sake of time because there's been about 12 or 15 time periods when famine occurred in Israel and in other countries, surrounding countries. What are some of the reasons for famine? Well, first of all, uh, natural, there's natural disasters that cause famines in countries uh, such as flooding or no rainfall or too much rainfall causes famine. Crops can perish when there's too much rainfall as well as not grow when there's not enough rainfall. Uh, there's warfare that has caused famine. In wars, countries go into famine because many times the resources they have for farming and for uh, providing food and so on for their people. Now, the men are out fighting battles. They're not there to farm and so on. And, and this was an agricultural society, uh, uh, Ruth, during the days of Ruth. But then what the major reason, and, and I'm not going to continue on with the reason for famine, I've got two or three pages of the stuff I've dug up in my notes about famine. Uh, if you want a copy of them, I will run it off for you here on the copier, and then you can get it for yourself. That'll save you having to dig it up. Uh, I, that means I worked very hard for you, so you can have that if that's what you want to have. So I saw you nodding your head. I had to put that in. I just want you to know how hard it was for me to dig all that stuff up, okay? But uh, I'm making a joke. Nobody's laughing. You know what somebody told me? My grandson told me over the weekend he was with us. He and his sister was with us. And I was said something. He said, Papa, I've heard that 15 times from you. I said, you can't. You're only 11 years old. He said, oh, I have, though. I said, so that's not, that's not why. I said, what, is that why you're not laughing right now? He said, Papa, we laughed the first time, and all the other 14, we've never laughed anymore. So maybe it's time for you to stop giving that. <laughs> He's just like his mamma. Okay, let's go on a little further. What? The main reason is the judgment of God. The judgment of God. Think of the days of Elijah, if you want to talk about famine. For three and a half years, they had no rainfall. There was, I mean, you, can you believe how dusty it was? Three and a half years with no rain. Everything dried up. There was no food. You, you remember how Elijah was provided for during those days? The ravens came and brought him food. Uh, he was by a little brook there, Sharith. And the ravens came and brought him food. I don't know if I would have liked that. Would you, Joan? No. A raven bringing me food because you know those ravens in the Middle East were sort of like vultures that we have here in East Tennessee and you know where they found the meat where those animals had died because of the famine because of no rainfall and they brought him uh, I heard one preacher preaching this one time and he said think of Elijah here this Hebrew prophet eating those big steaks I'm telling you it wasn't big steaks it was roadkill that's exactly what it was, where they had just died, and the ravens had picked meat out of them and brought them to him, and he had water there, so he had bread and water and, and, and meat. And then the brook dried up, and he was sent to a widow woman's house over in Serapeth, and she was a Gentile lady, and she was out gathering sticks to make a little pancake, so to speak, what we used to call here in the South, hoe cakes. You all know what I'm talking about, hoe cakes. I see heads nodding, so we, 
Every, some of you are as old as I am and maybe a little older. I'm not going to say how much. But anyway, uh, she said, she, he said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I, I'm making, a, I'm going to gather sticks to build a little fire here. And I'm going to make enough for me and my son. We're going to eat this and then we're going to die. And he said, oh, I don't think so. He said, God sent me here for you to take care of me. Now, what do you think about that? She's a widow woman, and she's a Gentile woman. He's a Jew, and God said, I want you to go over here. I have a widow woman who's going to sustain thee. And she didn't have anything to sustain anybody with. She used her last meal to make a hoe cake. So Thomas and I were talking about this in, in the office before I came out, uh, how that people today have taken the supernatural out of the scriptures. And if you take the miracles out of the Bible, you've just got another book. Because this Bible is miraculous. God wrote this Bible. The Holy Spirit authored this book. And if we don't believe and can't believe in the supernatural, what do we have to believe in? We have got to believe that God is the God of supernatural things. He works in the supernatural. The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ was the virgin born son of God. That's definitely supernatural. That when Elijah, here's what he said to her. He said, listen, don't, don't make this cake for you and your little boy. Give it to me first. Make it for me first. Why? He was a prophet of God and he represented God to her. Okay? The Old Testament prophet represented God to the people. And so he said, put God first and then you'll be taken care of. She obeyed him. That took some faith on her part. It takes faith to take all you've got and give it to somebody else when you don't know where the rest is coming from. But from that moment on till the very last day he stayed at her house, the Bible said this about her mill barrel, it never ran empty and her oil crews never went dry. Every day when she went back to get meal and oil to make her little cakes for her, she, her son and now the prophet of God, there was always enough for that particular day. How many has ever heard of a, a, a woman? She, she was actually a, a Dutch lady. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. Have you ever heard her? They made a movie about her life. You, did, did you see, you saw her personally? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, she spoke over there. Immediately she came on stage. I just started following because I had read the book. The Hiding Place. Wow. Well, we have world travelers in here. I didn't know that. So you've been to the Netherlands and went into the... Oh, you lived in the Netherlands. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So anyway, uh, I read the book years and years ago when I was a teenager. It's very fascinating. Very, I mean, to think about it. And then, of course, there's other books that have been written about her. And you know that they were hiding Jews in the top of their house. And the Germans came and found them. And they took her, her father, and her sister uh, into uh, concentration camps, put them in concentration camps. And her sister had some kind of a physical malady. I don't remember what it's called. I just remember this part of the book. And uh, she, had, she had a little bottle of medicine that she took with her into the concentration camp. She had to take a spoonful of it every day. And uh, up until, listen, up until the day she died, Every, every day when she went back to get medicine from that bottle, there was enough in it. Every day. That's written in the book. You can read it for yourself. Now, I know the skeptics say they don't believe stuff like that. I believe stuff like that. I believe that God is the God of, of might and power and wonder. I've seen the miraculous hand of God in my own life, and I know you have as well. Uh, we just had a little girl healed in our church uh, I've not told you about this. Her name is Avery. And they had told uh, the family that she possibly had leukemia. Uh, and my wife and I had noticed, we would say, there's something wrong with Avery. And every service, she would come up after service and she would hug me. She'd grab me and hug me. And she would tell me that she loved me. She has a little sister who's a year older than her. And they both would do that. And so her grandfather had them there at church on the Sunday. And uh, he stopped and he said, can we anoint Avery today that the doctor's given us a bad report about Avery? 
And I said, we surely will. So the church gathered around her. We anointed her with oil in the name of the Lord. Now that's going to tear some Baptists all to pieces because they don't believe that anymore. But see, I still believe the Bible. I believe all the Bible. I believe the whole Bible. I believe it's real. I believe it's true. When I was a kid in the church I was raised up in, they'd take people to a back room and anoint them because they were afraid somebody's going to call them some other denomination. Folks, the Bible is not a denominational book. The Bible, there's no denominations in the Bible. It's just truth. This is truth. And you need to believe everything in the Word of God, not just pick out what you want, what you don't want, to reject it. So we anointed her in the name of the Lord. And uh, we got the report back uh, a week ago. Said the report was perfect. There was nothing wrong with her. She would be able to live a normal life because she does not have leukemia. Well, what changed all of that? The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. So this lady, going back here, this lady experienced the supernatural because of her obedience to the man of God. Uh, so God is the God of supernatural. Many times in famine, famine was a result of the judgment of God when people had gone into apostasy, disobedience to God. God would allow famines to come to try to get their attention, to bring them back to God. Listen, if you've studied prophecy in the Word of God, which we have here in this class, you will discover that the Bible predicts famines for the future. The Bible says in the future events, there's going to be famines. There's going to be famines. And by the way, there's famines in countries now. There's uh, various countries of the world where they don't have enough to feed their, their starving. I read recently in India, they have trucks that go through the streets picking up the dead who've died during the night. Uh, there's not enough food to feed. Listen, here in America, we throw away enough food to feed the rest of the world. We are so blessed, but yet we take it for granted. So this was a time of famine. Now, in a time of famine, uh, things are different. It, it changes your perspective on life. It changes your perspective about God. Uh, how many has gone through some bad stuff in your life and and, you've, and just be honest, I mean, I'm telling you, I have. I've gone through some pretty tough times in my life. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I got hit by a freight train and knocked 875 feet down a railroad track. That wasn't uh, something easy to look at and accept when you're 18, 19 years old. Of course, I, I got over it, I thought. But anyway, uh, you know, I've had 10 surgeries in my life. Uh, this last episode where I fell through the the building and, and I was down for months and months. Uh, you know, there were days when the devil sent a little demon and camped on my bed and said, God's forsaken you. Why didn't, if, the God, if, if God loves you so much, why are you having to go through this stuff? Have you ever had things like that happen to you? These people were in a state of famine. There wasn't enough food to feed those two boys they had. There was enough food for Emelech and, and Naomi to eat. Uh, there, I mean, it was a time of famine. And sometimes, here's what you'll see in the Word of God. The first famine mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 12 about Abraham. And what did Abraham do? The Bible said he left the promised land. And what did he do? He went into Egypt. Jacob did the same thing years later when a famine hit. He left Canaan. He went into Egypt. And of course took his family there. Joseph was there to take care of them. In Egypt there was a famine. God had told Joseph through the dreams of Pharaoh there would be seven years of plenty, then there would be seven years of famine. And he said in the seven years of plenty you build these storage houses and so on, you store the grain so that in the seven years of famine there will be food that you can dispense out to your people as well as the people of the world. He's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways. In fact, greater than any other Old Testament character. Well, famine is, a, is sometimes brought on because of people's disobedience to God. The fact they reject God, they reject truth, they reject light. And so here is a time of famine for Ruth, I mean for Naomi and her family. And so in this time of famine, here's, here's what happens to them. Uh, they, they decide that they're going to leave Bethlehem, Judah, and they're just going to go for a little while down into the country of Moab. 
Now, Moab was on the east side of Israel. Uh, it, today, it's in the country of Jordan. That's where it is. The mountains of Moab, the country of Moab. And in, right in the middle of a desert, Moab is a very fertile country. At that time, it was as well. So in Moab, there was no famine. Everything was doing good in Moab. But the problem with Moab was these people were not worshipers of God. They worshiped idol gods. Their chief idol god that they worshiped was one called Comos. And uh, they worshiped this idol god. And uh, I was even looking in the Bible to see if I found anything on him because I studied Jewish history as well as the scriptures. And in 1 Kings eleven seven, 7, it said that Solomon had built a sanctuary, uh, a place where he could be worshiped in the days of Solomon. And um, that was against God, of course. The word Moab, I told you I'd be writing stuff on the board and I've not written one thing. How many is going to come back next week? Well, we've got two people coming back next week. That's going to be a blessing. I'm just kidding. Well, next week I will write some stuff on the board. I'll give you my whole outline. I'll come early enough to put it on the board so you'll have it. Okay. How many is happy with that? I heard somebody say, mm-hmm. You all are really responsive today. I like that about you. You're really responsive. It really helps me teach. I mean, man. <laughs> All right, listen. Moab, you know what it means? You know where they're from? You, the Moabites, you know where they're from? How many remember God looked down one day and saw Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plains? He saw their wickedness. It came up in his, in his nostrils as a very stinky place. And he decided to destroy that place. And so he sends, uh, he sends a messenger down. Two of them, in fact, go to Sodom where Lot's living. Lot's the, the nephew of Abraham. And he says, Lot, get out of here. I'm going to destroy this place. And you know, he had to drag them out because they were so deeply rooted in the activities of Sodom. Lot was sitting at the gate. He was a, he was a magistrate. He was, he was really well known. And Lot's wife didn't want to leave, and she turned and looked back. They were told not to look back. And she turned and looked back. And if, you, if you've got any, uh, an atlas of the Bible, they'll show you a rock over there that's still, still there that's called her, her pillar of salt. She was turned to a pillar of salt. It could have been that Lot and his family were not salt in Sodom. The Bible said we're to be salt and light. Maybe they weren't salt in Sodom, so God had to turn her to a pillar of salt because they weren't being salty Christians in Sodom. But God got them out, and the very night that they came out, Lot had two daughters. You remember the story? And uh, they, got to, they got to thinking. His, his daughter said, hey, it's just us. They thought there was nobody else left in the world. They thought it was just them. See, they didn't know but what God hadn't burnt the whole place down. So they thought, we're the only ones left. So his oldest daughter got a lot drunk. Uh, I don't know all the stuff they brought out of Sodom, but they brought alcohol with them. Somebody asked me the other day if I drank. I said, no, water, tea, stuff like that. I said, no, what do you mean do you drink alcohol? I said, no, I don't. I don't, never have. Not going to start now. I told this gentleman, I said, I've never known of anything good happening from, from alcohol. I tell you what I've seen in the ministry, I've seen kids that didn't have clothes. Their daddy would be a drunk. He would spend his money on booze, and didn't take care of his family, I've seen that. Look at the drugs and alcohol today that's rampant. Alcohol is the number one drug problem in America. Are you aware of that? And I, so I don't have anything good to say about stuff like that. I, I apologize to people. I don't want to be rude and hateful about it, but uh, I tell you what, I, I don't think we need this kind of stuff in our life when we're serving Jesus Christ. Now, that's my opinion. You all didn't ask for it, but I gave it to you anyway. So when Lot's daughter actually got pregnant from her own father, it was an incestuous relationship. The baby came. It was a male child. She named him Moab. 
Moab. And the word Moab in the Hebrew means this, from the father, or he is of my father. That's the meaning of the Hebrew word Moab. He is my, from my father. So it was a perpetual reminder of the beginnings of Moab and how it all came about. So this is Moab. Now you know what God said about Moab in Psalms 108 verse 9? He said, Moab is my wash pot. In today's vernacular, you know what we would be saying? Moab is my garbage can. Why? The people were idol worshipers. They did not acknowledge God whatsoever. They were totally self-absorbed in their idols and their worship of idols. And God says, those people are my garbage can. See, God, has a, God, God is a God of love, but God's also a God of hatred and wrath. He hates all evil. He doesn't hate the people, but he hates evil and evildoers. And the Bible said the evildoers will surely be cut off one day. And, it will, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen, folks. Everybody who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will not be in heaven. And there's only other one, place to, one other place to go. Right? See, we don't like for preachers to say stuff like that nowadays. We, you know, we don't like for preachers to tell it like it is. If you're not saved, there, you won't ever go to heaven without being born again. Jesus clearly said you must be born again. Okay? So this was Moab, and this is where they decided to go. It was a fertile country, a lot of things going on there. Now, we see, we see the, the famine in the land, and then I want us to look at their, their family. Uh, I've, I've only got a few more minutes. Are you still with me? Can we keep going deeper into this? Please nod or do something. Okay. Now look at, he said, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. We just, in, during Christmas, did, before Christmas, we studied some stuff about the birth of Christ, Bethlehem, Judah, Bethlehem of Judah. There were two Bethlehems in Israel. This is Bethlehem, Judah, in the part that's Judah. The other Bethlehem was in Galilee, the northern part of Israel. But Bethlehem, this is the same city that later on was called the city of David. He was anointed there on one particular time. It's the place where Jesus was born thousands of years from this date. So it's Bethlehem. Now, Sue, what does the word Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Bethlehem, house of bread. So where else would Jesus be born? Because he said, I am the bread which came down from God out of heaven. Right? Bethlehem. He couldn't have been born anywhere else. Uh, he could have been born in any other town or village in Palestine where, whatsoever. Why? Because Micah chapter 5, the prophet Micah had prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. In fact, when the wise men showed up asking where is he that is born king of the Jews, he got old Herod tore all to pieces because his title was king of the Jews. And so he inquired of the theologians of the day, the church people, where's Jesus going to be born? And they said, oh, in Bethlehem of Judea. They knew where he was going to be born, and they didn't care enough to even seek out the place to see if he had been born. That's how things were in the days of Jesus when he came into the world. The church people were so wrapped up in their religion, they didn't have time to go seek out where Jesus was be born was going to be born. But this is the Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethlehem is, was in an area where that all grains of Israel were grown in those fertile farming lands in Bethlehem. It was the bread basket of the nation of Israel. So Elimelech, that's his name, Elimelech. Now if you, you're in the process, maybe your family's in the process of having children or grandchildren, and it's going to be a boy, you might, may I suggest Elimelech for that boy? That would be a great name, wouldn't it, Ian? Elimelech? And we'll shorten it down to either Lim or Lech. So, uh, be a great name, don't you? Nancy, don't you think that'd be good? Oh, you don't? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought maybe you thought it would be funny. 
I mean, I would <laughs> limb or leg, whichever one you wanted. A limb or leg. You know what his name means? Anybody know? I'm going to tell you. God is my king. Elimelech. Let's put this on here. How, how do I spell it, Sue? E L E C H. God is my king. Now, I pointed this out recently. Anytime that you have a prefix, E L. Anybody tell me what E L is? It's the name of, it's one of the many names of God in the Bible. L, God. E L. Okay, you got a prefix here, E-L. So that's where we get God, and this means king. Melech, Melech. It means sovereign or kingship. So it's God is my king. Uh, let's take a... You remember me teaching you this about the E-L thing? Does anybody remember? Nobody remembers, okay. I'm really an effective teacher. Have y'all noticed? Nobody remembers anything I say. Okay, Abel. It's got an E-L. It's got a suffix. This is the name of God here. What is this in Hebrew? Breath of God. And we could go on on Bethel. You got a suffix here. Beth is house of God. You want to go on and hey, take the word Babel. B a b a. B E L. Bab is confusion. Of God. We could just go on and on throughout the Bible. The Hebrew names, any Hebrew name that's got a prefix or a suffix of E L, God, that's a, a name for God. That's one of his names. It's something to do with God. Um, Bethel. I, right now, I'm, I'm sorry. Did I hear? Oh, you were breathing. <laughs> Man, you breathe loud, don't you? So Elimelech, his name means God is my king. Now his wife's name is Naomi. N-A-O-M-I. You know what that means? Pleasant. She was a pleasant lady. Very pleasant. They named her Naomi. Somebody, her mother, her father named her. See, the Hebrews named their kids many times according to what was going on in the life when they were born or what they wanted that child to become. I'm erasing. Is that okay? That will never be put on this board again by me. Totally erased. All right, now, they had two boys. Uh, help me with the spelling here. I'm not looking at my notes. M-A-H-L-O-N. His name, you want to know how to pronounce it? Right here. May. Malone. Malone, that's how you pronounce it. The Hebrew word here, Malone. Everybody say Malone. 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 Okay. He had a brother named... C H what? Now, this is going to be funny. Here's the way you pronounce it the C H is like a K sound in English. It's Killone. His name is Killone. It's Malone and Killone. Now, you know the meanings? Okay, Malone means sick or sickly. Kilone means pining or wasted. Do you know why they named their kids this? When those kids were born, they were born during this time of famine. You know what Elimelech, who God is my king, should have done as a man, as a head of his household, he should have led his family closer to God during a bad time in his life. But rather than doing that, they slacked up on God. 
They didn't live for God like they should have. They lost their dedication to God. And these two boys were born during those days. And you know what it did, what it said about the parents? It said about the parents that they weren't living like they should have. They named their boys names that those boys' lives followed the rest of their days. And they got, by the time they got down in Moab for a few years there trying to get things better, the two boys ended up dying. They were sick when they left. They were pining. They were wasting. They had some type of a consumption or a disease or sickness that had hit them, but it simply typifies the lifestyle and the, the lack of dedication of the parents naming their sons those names. And that's, that's pitiful, isn't it? Now, my parents could have done a better job with me, I think. Larry. I've been called Larry. I've been called Larry. I've been called a lot of things that I can't mention in public. <laughs> you know? They could have made me, named me Bob or Ben, something like that. But anyway, this is, these are the names right here of the boys. This is the family. This family was made up of four people in the beginning. Then when the two sons get of age, they marry two women from Israel? Jewish women like they should have? No, they married heathen women with their heathen gods. They married two women. Listen to this now. And we love Ruth because she got converted. Hallelujah. Amen. She did. They married he, O R P H A and Ruth. So those are, the, those are two heathen women that were, that were included in that family. So, so now you have how many people? Four plus two is eight. You math. Is that right? See, nowadays in school, you can, you can make any number you want. Did you know that? Emma, do you know that? That's what they're teaching. They're teaching it can be whatever you want it to be. Four plus two does not mean necessarily mean six in today's CRT stuff that they're bringing into the classrooms. So there were six people. Does anybody know what the number six means in Scripture on you? The number of man. Six is the number of man. Would you all like to study numbers sometimes? You would? What's the number one mean? Number one. No. I can't spell worth a flip here. Ian, Ian being here has got me nervous. I just spelled it the way I think it ought to be spelled. Let me give you a little lesson in numbers. I've got to hurry here. We're, we're running. Out. I've got five more minutes. Every number in the Bible has a meaning. I'm not going to keep going on the four. I know you know that. I've taught that here when we studied some stuff. Number of the world. Hey, five. Somebody tell me five. Nobody know? Grace. Grace. Five. The fifth time that Noah's name is found in Genesis chapter 5, it says he found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Ruth, the fifth time she's found in the book of Ruth, she finds grace and favor in the eyes of Boaz. Does that not mean anything to you all? We could just go. Six is the number of man. Somebody tell me what the number of the Antichrist is. Six. Hey, you got that? Boy, you know that one, don't you? <laughs> you all know anything about the devil. Oh, come on, help me, Jesus. That's, that's the number of the Antichrist. Sevens, anybody know? Perfection, it's the number of God. Everything about God in the Bible is in sevens. Book of Revelation, seven, 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 sevens. Eight, we just gave you this earlier. What is it? New beginning. I'm going to get you to ten here right in a minute. And then I'm going to stop. We're going to go on. 
Are you getting anything out of this lesson today or not? Nothing? Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Huh? Fruit of the Spirit? And then 10 is testimony. Everything about your body is in numerics. How many holes do you have in your head? No, count. You got two nose holes. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is the number of completeness or perfection. So any time you want to look at completeness, God completely enhoused your brain in a skull that has seven openings in it. Some are to let the knowledge out. Some are to bring the knowledge in. Are you all with me? Huh? Cut your fingers. If you're normal, but who's to say who's normal? You got five. Five. Five is the number of what? So it's by the grace of God that you haven't lost any of your hands yet. You got five, grace. You got another five here. Five and five is what? So you got a testimony, a double testimony of the grace of God in your, right here in your hands. And you could just, listen, your whole body is made up like this. All the numbers of the Bible have great significance. In fact, I'll teach these one of these days, Lord willing, if we can. Okay, we're done. Oh, I'm sorry. What does Ruth mean? Friend, friendly, compassionate friend. Um, I don't remember what Orpha, Orpha means. Orpha. I had an aunt named Orpha. I don't remember. I'll have to consult my memory on Orpha. It means something, it has something to do with, uh, well, I don't remember. Something to do with a house, something to do with building a house. It has something to do with a, a, a structure, structure. Oprah, Oprah said that was supposed to be her name, but they made a mistake on her birth certificate. She ended up Oprah instead of Orpah. Did I put and Oprah up here? I didn't. Did no, I? no, you didn't. Okay. All right. Well, I've given you the introduction to the study. And next week we're going to get into the remainder of chapter one. We're going to really get down into it. Um, they're going to Moab. And then we'll be talking about how that they eventually hear word that there's bread back in, back in Israel, back in Bethlehem. God has visited his people. And then we're, we'll be talking. Listen. These four chapters are just chucked full of all kinds of good stuff. And it all relates to redemption. I don't want you to miss it. And if you've got friends that need to study about redemption, tell them to come. Because I'd love to see them here. And uh, we'd love to be able to get it out to a lot of new people. Okay, let's bow for prayer as we close today. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. We thank you for this time that we can fellowship in your word with you and the Holy Spirit. I just pray, Father, you'll use this to help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and increase our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.